guessing live coding, but this is from Maxime uh, Bujnet. I have probably slaughtered that name as well. I'll let him correct me when he arrives. Uh, but this is going to be an interesting talk on 20 minutes to build a serverless COVID-19 REST and GraphQL API. So that should be exciting. So uh, Maxime, if you can join the stage here. Hey. Hey, hey. You can so see me. Is it is it live coding? Yes. Uh, well, live. Yeah, live coding. I'm try. I will try to get rid of the slides as soon as possible. I don't have many, and they will like go pretty quickly, hopefully. And yeah, I, I will try to show things instead of just telling about things as much as All possible. All right. I haven't looked at Mongo in forever, so I'm super excited to see like where the how the ecosystem has changed. I'm going to give you as much time as possible to uh, cover all the pieces. So I will let you just take it away, and I'm going to sit back and watch. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye. Hey, everybody. So let me share my screen. Hopefully, that works on the screen. That's fine. Cool. All right. So hey, everybody. I'm Maxim Bernier. Uh, yeah. The Maxim Bernier, which is a bit different from, yeah, uh, but yeah, all good. So uh, I'm a senior developer advocate uh, at MongoDB, and today I want to show you how to build, uh, how I built actually a REST and GraphQL API using uh, the COVID-19 um, data set from John Hopkins University. Um, so I guess everybody knows, it works. So everybody knows that, uh, 2019 was fine, and of course this year, you know, we are in 2020. So I guess that's no news for everybody because we are not in the same room uh, talking about GraphQL and all the cool stuff. So that's that's kind of sad, but that's where we are. Um, so for me, this was some kind of inspiration because I wanted to uh, basically make all the data about uh, COVID available uh, and like share it and make it public, et cetera, et cetera, and make it very accessible. So I had two goals. One was to uh, make some charts uh, so anyone can just in a in a glance, you know, get a get an idea of what the data is and and uh, how to like just get an idea of the data. And then of course publish some APIs, so GraphQL and REST APIs. So I did some charts. Uh, at the end, it looks like this. I, I, been using MongoDB charts, which is uh, included already uh, in MongoDB Atlas. Uh, if I have some time, I will show you that eventually. Uh, so it looks like this, just so you have an ID. Uh, I will show you the link as well to that dashboard at the end. Um, so yeah, so it was inspired by John Hopkins University. I think everybody saw that uh, cool page uh, where they have all the graphs and all the numbers. So it looks very impressive, but yeah, I thought I could do better, I think. Uh, like do maybe more maps, or show different views, different things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, luckily, uh, they published at some point, not at the very beginning, but at some point, a GitHub page uh, which looks like this. So you have a GitHub repository. It contains a bunch of CSV files, basically. So they've been using like a lot of data sources. Like when I say a lot, that that's a lot, right? They, they like almost every day they add a new one, and you have many, many, many data sources. So you would expect to be like in the right place, right? Because they aggregated so many things, they did so much cleanup and so much sorting. And so you would be expect to be on a very clean and and like worked data set, right? Uh, so let's see what we have actually. So there, are, there is a folder where you have uh, daily reports. Uh, so in here you have a bunch of CSV files, one per day. So looks fine. Let's have a look to the first one. The first one uh, looks like this. So you have province slash state, country slash regions, okay, to the header line. And you have a bunch of countries, looks like a, a date with a weird format, and a bunch of uh, numbers with some missing numbers because data is not complete, etc, etc. So why not? It looks good enough, right? Look, looks correct. Let's see now a random one in April. Oh, so Looks like everything is different. So I have new colons, uh, province, no, it's province, underscore state, not slash state, same for region. So different names for the fields. Uh, I have a different date format. I have a random underscore here. Uh, 
some numbers issue as well I see on the latitude and longitude. Uh, no more missing numbers. Now I have zeros everywhere. Um, so looks very different actually. So it's not really consistent nor not predictable, right? As a user, if I had to query something that would have been built on top of that, those CSVs, uh, I, I can't really do that, right? Because if I query something in January, I would have one result. If I do the same query in April, I would have something maybe a bit different with different keys values, et cetera, unless I redo all the cleaning and sorting on my hand. So uh, not good, not very good. So when you build an API, you have to be as predictable and as uh, thorough as possible. So you have to keep what they call the what the fuck per minute uh, as low as possible. Uh, so please be consistent, be predictable. So when somebody sends a query, for example, in January, uh, they expect to have some fields. And if they send the same query, but filter on April, you would expect to find probably something very uh, sensibly the same thing, right? Sensibly the same same fields, same kind of values, et cetera, et cetera, same, same types, same formats, et cetera, et cetera. So, to be a good API guy, just be predictable. So let's see, what, what else do we have? If we have, we have also a time series folder. So uh, in here I have uh, apparently five files, uh, three global files. So for uh, countries and big states, because sometimes countries are subdivided in states, the, the big ones. Um, cool. And then I have two US files with more details apparently on the US. Uh, so that looks looks promising, right? I have confirmed, death, and recovered, apparently separated in three files. Uh, let's have a look to one of them. Uh, looks neat, right? You have uh, state, region, latitude, longitude. Looks like nothing too crazy, and it's always the same file, so it's always the same fields. And looks like every day they are adding a new colon at the end, right? So on the far right over there, because of course it's a big, big file, going like to the right, and you have uh, one more day added every day. So looks fine. So here you have only France. So you see I have all the French islands and one without regions, which is the France mainland, right? The, the continent one. Um, cool, why not? Um, the issue with that is if I just Mongo import, so because we have a tool called Mongo import, if I just import that, I will have a very terrible schema to work with. And the schema design in MongoDB, if you have one thing to remember, is that it's very, very important. You can't just make it up like this, and that that, that would be very un uncomfortable to work with. As you can see, I have like the date is a key because it comes from um, this, right? The key would be uh, the name of the field, you know, in the first line in the header. Uh, so, like, it, it's not very convenient to work with. What I would like to have instead is something like this, right? The date and some actual ISO date, date which would be easier to uh, work with for greater than, less than. Uh, it would enable a lot more features, for example. And same thing, latitude and longitude. That's not very. That's not what we want. Ideally, we want a GeoJSON object, which is more uh, in the norm, and with this, it unlocks also a lot of features in MongoDB, uh, like uh, 2D indexes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, the, all the maps you saw as well, of course, uh, on the chart. So, uh, and I'm also missing some information that could come handy. Uh, so, they also provide another file at the top, uh, like one folder above that, which is called uh, the lookup table, and in here you can see some IDs some ISO 2, ISO 3 codes. Uh, you can also see some, um, like the population, which could come very handy for some calculations eventually, uh, some stuff like that. So basically, the plan from here is to do uh, a lookup. So join uh, one line from the first file with one line in this file, join them, join them together. Uh, but I don't want to keep like all the data within the same document. So I'm going to chop that down into multiple uh, documents. So basically the ID uh, of my schema design need to have at the end one place, one date, and one set of values, right? So confirm, death, and recovered for each day. So with some uh, Python magic, and I'm going to definitely not show you that, ta -da, I have something like that. So my final documents, uh, I have 
document uh, I have uh, key values about the place uh, that I'm uh, trying to look at. I have one date and I have a set of fields. And you see with the MongoDB also, I used uh, what we call the aggregation pipeline. So uh, you have at the bottom, uh, confirm daily, test daily and recover daily, which are calculated field because um, the confirmed death and recover that I have are actually uh, cumulative values. So if I do, of course, today minus yesterday, uh, I have uh, the actual daily values for that particular day. Um, so yeah, we have now something I can really work with. That's a clean, uh, clean schema. I have also like, as you can see, clean uh, the data set. So I have the right types everywhere, uh, geosystem, et cetera, et cetera. So I can work with that. So at the end, because I have multiple files and multiple collections, so I came up with like five collections total. So global is the one you would expect. Uh, with the global files where you have the countries and eventually the states subdivided in states. Uh, like France, for example, it's subdivided into a few, uh, few, few documents. Of course, one per day, but also one per state. Uh, then you have this one at the bottom, US only, which is the file with the two oranges documents where you have only the US, right? It's only the US. And as you can see, there is like a million documents but with a lot of details, right? So it's down to the county, right? So divided by state and then by county, uh, counties. And if I regroup global and US only, I have global and US, right? So I have like way more details. As you can see in this collection, I have 1.1 uh, million documents. And so in here, um, I have uh, like all the, all the coverage, all the global coverage, but I also have more details about the US in this collection. And of course, I removed the double count uh, that comes from global, right? Because global already covers the US as a country, not like with all the details. Uh, and with this, I also created with the MongoDB aggregation pipeline, a country's summary collection, which is basically more simple. Uh, as you can see, less documents. It's just one country, uh, one date, and one set of numbers. So that's very convenient when you want to do uh, like big maps uh, for uh, daily values or something like that. And then for the uh, GraphQL and especially for the REST API, I created one metadata collection, which is one single document, which contains basically the cardinality of each of the fields. Uh, so that's gonna help to eventually process and build automatically your, uh, your REST API calls. So, now let's hack. We have a GraphQL and a REST uh, API to implement. So let's have a look. So uh, for this, of course, I will be using MongoDB Atlas, which is MongoDB um, as a service in the cloud. Uh, what you see here is uh, my production cluster actually. So where I actually deployed all that data. So you have a pre-prod server and uh, the actual prod server, which I'm gonna use here because you know, it's just convenient. Uh, everything I'm showing you today works also within the free tier, right? So if you want to try this yourself, create an account, it's free, and then you can create a free cluster. You go in here, create new cluster, and then you can pick the provider of your choice. You click on the region of your choice. So for example, I can go to Paris, and then you can pick your cluster tier with the free one being here at the top, which would be enough basically to, to do what I'm doing here. Uh, you can pick a cluster and you can pick your MongoDB version you want to run with and you can activate backups, et cetera, et cetera. And you click create cluster. It takes about 10 minutes to be online. Uh, so I don't really have time to do that right now. So that's why it's already up. And at the end, you have a box like this, which represents your replica sets, and you have all the options to change and do all the stuff you want. So in here, uh, I have, as you can see, like every hour, basically, uh, I have a cron that runs and runs that Python script that does all the transformations for me. So it's updated every hour. I replace everything uh, in a single uh, operation. So uh, let's see. So I have all the data in there. I can show you very quickly. that it's actually in there. I have also Mongo imported uh, all the collections. So just so you have the two visions, 
of uh, something completely unworked, which is in the in this in this collection here. So that just the flat data, not transformed. And in here, my five collections transformed and what I just showed you. Uh, so to create those uh, GraphQL and REST APIs uh, serverless, I will use, of course, MongoDB Realm, which is here at the top. Maybe I can make this a bit bigger, uh, which is MongoDB uh, basically serverless applications. So I'm going to Realm. And I create a new application. So that's my, pro my production one. I call that API days. And I'm going to link to the COVID cluster. And because it's deployed in Ireland, and uh, in EU West one, I will just do a local deployment and just deploy it in Ireland. So my application stays close to my actual cluster. Uh, cool. So in here, I have a bunch of things. As you can see, I have functions and triggers, GraphQL, SDKs integration, set Third party services like uh, Amazon, et cetera, integration. I have hosting if I want to host a website, many things, and users and schema rules, et cetera. First thing I want to do, so I have linked my cluster, right? So I'm already linked to my data in MongoDB. I want to add a collection, and they are in here. But what I want to do is add a, um, a schema on it. So I'm going to use just one of them, global. And I'm going to say I want users to be able to read only because I want to make a public REST API configure the collection. I'm going to generate a schema. So you click generate schema. Uh, just click here. Takes a few seconds to do a sampling of the documents. And it's going to create one schema for me. If I want, I can fix it. And actually in here, I wasn't lucky and I'm missing the state. Looks like I'm missing the state. So I can just modify that. Cool. I can just click Save. What did I do? Uh, state string, of course. Cool. Now, um, I have a schema. I can activate the GraphQL endpoint. And if I come in here, Ready, boom, it works, right? I have the GraphQL endpoint, and I have also the plural version of that, so globals, even if it's weird, and I have the endpoint that works, and it's online. To prove that it's online, you have in here the, the URL, the endpoint, the webhook that people can use. Uh, if I copy paste this, and come in here, Oh, and I forgot something. Uh, I need authentication actually here, right? Because uh, this is of course secured by default. So I need also to activate here in the app users. I need to go in here, here, activate anonymous authentication. I have more, of course. So if I want, I could also use Facebook or Google APIs for authentications, but we'll just go simple and deploy that. So I deploy. Cool, come back here. So in here, I have, it comes actually from here, you have your uh, application ID, which is a unique application ID of my Realm application. So first I need a token. So I take this, I update my app ID in here. And with this here, I can generate token. With this access token, I can now send this GraphQL query. So I just need to replace here in the authorization bearer the token. And my query, as you can see, I'm querying globals and I'm sending one query in France to uh, the continent. So state ex exists false with the date greater than December 1st, sort by date. And I want the date and confirm daily cases just to see if I can go see my parents, for example, uh, for Christmas. And if I do that, I have a nice error because I forgot to replace the app ID, which is here. Where is app ID? Cool. Let's try that again. Didn't see nothing. Boom. Here I am. And that's it. My GraphQL is online. So now uh, let's have a look and do the REST API. And looks like it's going to be hard for Christmas. Uh, but that's just a detail. 
Um, so now I want to do a REST API. So REST API, I go to third party services. I go add a service. Of course, I choose HTTP over the others, but I have integration with many services. Call that REST API, very original from me. I create a webhook. In this webhook, I'm going to name it global. Don't really need to touch anything. My webhook is here. I'm going to need a post, uh, get, sorry, because I want to get things. And I could have security in here, but I'm not going to bother for now. Let I say save, and I have a function. So settings are here. My function is here. And if I want to, so as you can see, I can play with the payload, the queries, et cetera, et cetera, as a body and all the options. But here, I just want to do something simple. Um, so, oh, no, I don't want this line. I want this one. Query a document. So as you can see here, I can retrieve. I hope it's big enough. I can retrieve my MongoDB Atlas cluster context. And in the COVID-19 global database, I can do a find one and return that doc in here at the bottom. Say doc. I can save and deploy. Say deploy. And here in the settings, I can just retrieve that call command. And if I copy paste this in Postman, oops, don't need the curl actually. If I use Postman, boom, I have already my API and it works. And because I didn't activate the security, I don't have any security here. So that's basically it. It works, right? Uh, I can make this function, of course, a lot better. So if I show you what I have actually in production, looks like this. That's the code I'm using in production. So as you can see, I'm retrieving some payload queries, same service, the same, same line of code I used earlier. Here I'm building from the query parameters, the query, the project, and the sort, which is by default. And at the bottom, as you can see, just collection.find, query and projection, sort to an array, and then in the body, in the response, I just set the body with the documents. And if I just do save, and redeploy this, go back to Postman and say I want a country, France, with, um, what is it? Um, I want maybe the date, uh, the mean date, greater than uh, December 1st, if I say send. I have my data and it's, uh, well, it looks big, but if I do for just a few days ago, I have a bit less, right? So it works, that's it, it's online. So that's basically it. Thank you a lot for listening to my talk. I hope you liked it. Here are all the links. Uh, basically, everything I explained is already in three blog posts that are published on the developer.mongodb.com uh, dev developer hub. Uh, the Python script that I use to clean the data is available as well in this in here. And the MongoDB charts is also in here. Uh, so I think you saw that, but in the presentation, where is it? I lost it, of course. But yes, with MongoDB charts, I also built this, which you can also just use and yeah, which is built on top of the same cluster we use actually. So I love my internet when I'm doing presentations. Yes, so that's it. Do you have any questions? That is fantastic. I mean, I've it's been a long time since I've uh, used Mongo. They didn't even yeah. have a hosted product back when I tried it last. It um, evolved a lot. That's... Like we worked a yeah. lot on the platform and uh, on, on evolving the different services that you have basically around the database itself. Uh, so as you can see, like you have the applications, you have the charts, you have like many many things. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's really, uh, really impressive. It's, uh, it's making me want.
and give it a give it a go again here. So <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's no question. One comment there from Michael about uh, some, some potential tricks or data governance um, things with with Python looks like. Um, yeah, but um, any any specific questions regarding the talk in, in the chat? Uh, I know we're just bumping up here to the break, and I want to give everybody a chance to to actually go eat something. Uh, the morning's been absolutely fantastic with just a lot of great talks and um, tools like like Mongo. Uh, you know, are really helping provide just a rich ecosystem for a lot of different kinds of data types, a lot of different kinds of content models that you would need to store. GraphQL. But at the end of the day, you still need to pick the right uh, storage engine for these tools. And when you have a, a rich ecosystem like with MongoDB and the support for the triggers and the cleaning of the data and all that kind of, those kind of pieces, those are the parts GraphQL just doesn't have a solution for. It's, it's the access part. And so having players like Mongo really help make uh, supporting GraphQL really make it be a viable option for a lot of businesses. Uh, yeah. With that, then I'm going to go ahead and let everybody uh, break. This is the part where like this room stands up and leaves. But um, so uh, we'll break for break for lunch or wherever you are, your time zone, whatever it is you need to do. Uh, we will be picking up again with some more talks uh, after after the break, uh, starting at 1:30 Central, and we'll be having a really interesting talk on GraphQL mesh technology from the Guild. Uh, specifically with with uh, Uri Goldstein, and um, yeah, so we'll see you all back at one thirty. And thanks again, Maxime, for the awesome talk. Yeah, thanks. I hope you liked it. It was a good refresher of uh, MongoDB's latest uh, stuff in the cloud. Thank you very much. See you around. All right. Bye.